page 61 with me. Let me just try and give you a little sense of our bearings and where we're going to go this morning as we look at this. In uh, chapter 5, verse 2, we see a theme that's going to come up many, many times in the book of Exodus and comes up in the context of the plagues as well. Look at what Pharaoh said in verse 2 of chapter 5, page 61. Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh is saying, who is he? He's not a god of Egypt. He's not a god I recognize. I don't know what he's like. Quite frankly, I don't rate him and I don't rate you, so why should I fear him? Flick with me forwards to chapter 6, verse 2 over the page, on page 62. The same question of who is God, who is the Lord, comes up. Verse 2. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Now that word, when you see L-O-R-D in capitals, in the Old Testament, it's the word for God's own name for himself. Uh, often known with the technical term the tetragrammaton because it's got four letters in it in the original Hebrew or Yahweh or Jehovah as it's sometimes kind of translated to today. The name of God was considered so holy by the Jewish people that when they would be reading the scriptures they wouldn't even say it. They would just say Hashem which means the name. He would be known as the name. But it's who God is, what he's like, what his character is like. And notice here he says that thus far in the book of the, in the Bible, he hasn't revealed himself fully by his name. People of the God uh, at that point knew something about him, something about his grace, something about his love and mercy, but they didn't know all of it. They didn't know fully who he was. But read on with me to verse 6. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. In other words, God says that when he saves them, when he redeems them, rescues them from slavery in Egypt, then God's people will see what he's really like. And so as we look at this this morning, this is really, uh, uh, as we look at the place, this is really... God revealing himself to us, God showing us what he's like. Now you might say, okay, well that's so much of interest, but why does that particularly matter to us today? Well look, many people today, many, many people don't know who the God of the Bible is. A lot of other people, when you talk to them about the God of the Bible, they have their own kind of imagination or construct about who God of the Bible is. And they often say, well I don't like the God of the Bible because he's like this. And then you say, really, where did you get that from? It's often second or third hand. It may be you're here this morning and you're saying, look, I'm not even sure that I believe that there is a God of the Bible. Uh, we've been told by successive generations that there is no God, that this world is all there is, that the things we can touch and see and hear, there's nothing beyond that. But it's interesting, isn't it, that despite that, that leaves us with a feeling of there should be something more, and also a sense that there's something missing in life without God. But secondly, even those who do say, okay, I'm prepared to think that there might be a God, often have a kind of a distorted view of what he's like when you actually compare him to the God of scriptures. Uh, sociologist and author Mary Aberstadt has written an interesting book called How the West Really Lost God. And her thesis in the book is this. It has long been recognized that our experience of our earthly fathers informs our opinions about our heavenly fathers. And therefore, she says, that in the West, as the family has disintegrated over the past couple of generations or so, and as fathers have increasingly been absent, or not been the fathers that they should be, then we have read into that 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 is what God is like, that God is absent, that God is not the Heavenly Father that he should be. I think that's particularly interesting for the area we live in here, because I was speaking to a representative from the charity, the Cripplegate Foundation, a couple of years ago. I was asking her, according to the Cripplegate Foundation, which is a large grant-making body, seeking to deal with some of the social problems in this area, what the biggest problems are. And she said to me that her number one pick, the biggest problem, would be the fatherless generation in this area. That too many families haven't got a father who's really present. And if that's the case that that informs our view about our Heavenly Father, then we might be thinking that God is not present. That God is disinterested. That God is not the type of God that we would actually want to be in a relationship with. Look, I don't know where you're coming from this morning, but come with me as we see 
through these incidents as God rescues his people and uses the miraculous plagues to do that, to liberate his people from slavery to Egypt, what God is really like. Look, first of all, as we see the Lord's sovereign power versus Pharaoh's impotence. The Lord's sovereign power versus Pharaoh's impotence. The way that the narrative is written throughout this, um, this passage is to compare God with Pharaoh. I wonder if you noticed early on in the reading that God is compared with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is also called sometimes the king of Egypt. And it's really a battle between two kings, the king of the universe, the king of heaven and earth, God himself, and the king of Egypt. And in context of the time, people would see the importance of that. We don't know exactly which Pharaoh of the many Pharaohs this is. It might have been Amenhotep II or Ramses II, they seem the most likely candidates. But either of those two, or any of the Pharaohs, were considered to be God on earth. They were celebrated and worshipped as divine. They were worshipped as um, part of the god Horus, or the son of Re, and part of the kind of the many gods of Egypt. Divine representatives on earth. And do you notice how all of the dealings that we had read to us are between Moses and Aaron, and God speaking through them, and Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the one with the power, it seems, to decide when they leave. Pharaoh is the one who enforces their labor and makes it harder on them and decides they're not going to leave. It's really a battle of wills between the God, the king of the universe, the king of heaven and earth, and Pharaoh, the kind of set up man God, and seeing who is more powerful. And one other thing just to say as we kind of get into it is the plagues are clearly in this context of the book of Exodus miraculous. Now you might be a person here this morning saying, I don't think there's any such thing as the miraculous, and so therefore I think this is far-fetched. And over the years, many, many people have tried to kind of reconstruct the narrative, making out that these events are natural events that merely happened and that someone read the supernatural into afterwards. Any of those attempts when you actually look into them become very ridiculous very, very quickly. Because it's clearly this is totally miraculous. Now, if you are a person who says, I don't believe in the miraculous, and often I hear people say things like, I can't believe in the miraculous, I'm a more scientific type person, science has disproved miracles, can I just raise a little question mark over that, to maybe help open you up this morning? First of all, it's impossible that science would be able to disprove the miraculous. Science only deals with nature, and the miraculous is by definition super nature, supernatural. Science can't prove or disprove anything that is supernatural, it's beyond its scope. So if you say that there is only science and there's no such thing as a supernatural, just please recognize that's a faith position. It's a position of belief. And I would merely ask you to um, apply the same standards you probably want me to apply, which is, is it blind belief, blind faith, or are there evidence for it? Science can't give you evidence for it, so what is your evidence for it? But the Bible is very clear. There is a natural world and a supernatural world, and God rules them both. And God intervenes sometimes in the natural world through supernatural miracles. And that is what he's doing here in the Exodus. Let's look more closely at the plagues. There are ten plagues, or nine, depending on how you count it, if you want to count the last two together. The plagues are turning the Nile into blood, uh, the plague of frogs, the plagues of gnats, and the plagues of flies, the death of the livestock, boils, hail that kills everything, locusts that kill the remaining things that are alive, darkness is the last plague linked to the death of the firstborn if you take those as two plagues to be um, counted together. And the point about these plagues is they reveal God's power. Do you notice how those plagues escalate in power and severity? First of all, Moses and uh, Aaron go to Pharaoh and they turn their uh, staff into a snake. And um, the uh, Egyptian magicians are able to match that. So look with me at chapter 7, verses 10 to 13, on page 63. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did it just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men, the sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. But notice, each one threw down his staff and it became a snake, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not miss them. So the first few miracles are kind of matched. The next one after this is the magicians match the turning of the Nile into blood. And then they're able to match, we're told, in chapter 8, verse 6, frogs coming up and over and covering the land. And the magicians do the same thing, but interestingly, they can't remove the frogs. And then chapter 8, verses 16 to 18, we get the plague of gnats. And at this point, 
The magicians can't match it. The point is, is that God is going through the gears, if you like. There's lots of reasons for that, both to display his power and also what's in the second point, to display his mercy. And the Egyptian ma magicians and sorcerers are able to match it to a degree, to a point, you know, to the kind of second or third um, point. But then they just can't match it. And even in these early miracles, there's a sense in which just the power and scope of God is far beyond them. Now, you might be interested in kind of thinking, well, how can they match it? Is it kind of a parlor trick, or do they really match it? We don't know. It's worth saying that because there is a supernatural realm, there are real supernatural forces that are set up against God, not in the sense of a cosmic battle between good and evil. God is God. He's in control of all things. But there is a real supernatural realm, which is why we shouldn't mess around with it. And they are able to do some powerful things here. But notice the complete disjunct between God's power and the power of the magicians, very soon he leaves them in his wake. One of the other things that's worth seeing is that these plagues are linked to creation. And the point of that is that just as God creates all things, so God can act in judgment if you like to unravel creation. He is completely in control of what he does with his created order with his world. He can create it and he can also undo it, uncreate it if you like. So it's um, very interesting, these are referred to as mighty acts of judgment. Chapter 7, verse 4, just flick back, page 63. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. God is a God of life and blessing and goodness and love and creation, and all the things we enjoy. But if we come on the wrong side of as Pharaoh and Egypt does, then he can act in judgment and bring destruction and death and pain and suffering. And that reveals his sovereign power as well. The plays are linked to creation. You see it in some of the detail. I just want to bring bits of it out for you. I'm sorry that we'll have to go quite quickly. But the first plague is turning the Nile into, the, into blood. Now, the Nile was the water source that gave life to Egypt. And so the very first plague interacts with Egypt and bringing, if you like, death into a situation where there's life. Now that's also interesting that it links to the creation because the very first thing that God does is he sets up the world with all the kind of capacity for life. So the last thing before we get vegetation in creation is we get water because, of course, water leads to plants. Genesis 1 verse 10, God gathers the waters together and then we get life. The next great act is the act of creating vegetation. Here, do you notice that the water is struck and it brings about death? Actually, the phrasing in chapter 7, verse 19, don't need to look it up, when you hear the phrase, there will be blood, is actually, let there be blood, which matches the same phrasing in um, the creation. Let there be light, let there be water, and there was. Here, there's let there be blood. So it deliberately is echoing the creation account. The point is, God can act in creation, and he can also act in judgment. He is the sovereign Lord. Then in creation, I wonder if you remember from Genesis, God makes the expanse of creation, the heavens and the earth, and the waters and the dry land. And then the next thing he does is he fills the creation. And he does so in a very orderly way, so that the animals kind of stay in their particular realms, as it were. The fish stay in the sea, the birds stay in the air, the animals on the ground stay on the dry ground. And you might think, well, where else are they going to go? But do you notice that when God curses that, for example, when he brings the frogs, the frogs come up from the water, but they invade the whole land. In other words, these are water animals who are starting to cross over the boundaries, bringing disorder. Similarly, the gnats come from the dust of the ground, but they infest the people and the animals. And then flies come from the air, and they invade the houses and the palace of Pharaoh. The point is that God creates an orderly creation, but in judgment, disorder comes about. It's again mirroring the creation account. And then lastly, the plagues increase in severity. The first few plagues cause discomfort, water to blood, frogs and gnats. The second three plagues start to cause destruction. Flies, we're told, ruin the land. The livestock becomes diseased. Boils on Egyptians and animals start to ruin them, spoil them. And then the final three or four plagues are about death. Hail kills everything on it. The locusts kill anything that's left alive after that. And then darkness is symbolic of death in the Bible, and then we have the death of the firstborn. 
The point is, is that the severity is increasing all along the way. Now let's take stock. The point is, is that just as God used his power in creation, so he can use his power in judgment and decreation, if you like. Just as God brings blessings of comfort, health, life, so God can act in judgment because he is the sovereign Lord to bring discomfort, disease, and death. I remember a number of years ago um, when I was windsurfing out on the sea. Um, as I was out windsurfing, the kind of wind dropped and I started drifting on my windsurfer, teetering along. I was about half a mile to a mile out and I drifted into a shipping lane. And uh, I could see this very large tanker coming from me. I was like pumping my sail, trying to move, but I was just going nowhere and the tide was going against me as so I was drifting on the tide. And the tanker, when it was about 400 yards from me, gave a massive blast on its horn. And it's absolutely terrifying, and I had no ability to move at all. And fortunately, it, it couldn't really move either, but it was just kind of going straight on its course. And it came in at about 50 to 100 yards of me. There I was, half a mile to a mile out, in the midst of the massive sea, with a tanker coming past me. And let, can I just say, I felt very, very small. And I saw how very, very big the world is at that moment. Sometimes in life, we get that sense of, we are actually very small, and the world is very big. And yet the world to God is just one of many, many stars in the universe. God is enormous. He is sovereign in power. It is ridiculous that Pharaoh has set himself up against God as if man can challenge God. And so much of our modern age is about making us feel big and important, when in fact, humility is a much more attractive virtue when we have a sense of our smallness. We are small, God loves us, but we're not in control of everything. I can't even control my two-year-old. Let alone control the world. God can control everything. He controls creation. He is also in control of judgment. He is the sovereign Lord. He is powerful. Pharaoh very quickly is shown to be impotent. Well, it can mind that all the talk of God's sovereign power and judgment kind of turns you off a little bit. You're thinking, this is exactly the type of God I don't want to believe in a God who's vindictive and nasty. I want you to see God's incredible mercy in the plagues, the incredible mercy of God. He does not want to bring about discomfort, disorder, death. He does everything he can to try to stop it. Look back at Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Page 61. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. I will not let him go. Now, if God wanted to be vindictive, why does he give Pharaoh a vast warning? He calls on him. He pleads with him. Let them go. He doesn't even step in with a plague straight away. He shows him a miraculous sign to prove that he's from God, the staff turning to the snakes. And then Pharaoh still doesn't believe him. So God then does the very minor kind of plague, if you like, of turning the Nile into blood, which can be undone. It doesn't bring instant discomfort. certainly doesn't bring instant destruction and death. The point is, God goes through the gears. He's gentle. He's merciful. He gives Pharaoh every chance, every chance, to turn away, to repent, to let his people go. And let's not kill ourselves. Pharaoh is not a pussycat. This is the man who is a complete despot. You see what he does after this first miracle. After this first miracle he increases the labor. Here is a slave driver. We're talking about slavery here. This is not kind of boys will be boys. You know, he's being a little bit naughty. This is an enslaved people, enslaved for over 400 years, not even treated as human beings, treated as animals, and Pharaoh thinks he can do with them like that when he wants. These are God's people. God will fight for his people. But God is so gracious to Pharaoh. Just like a patient father won't fly off the handle with their children, but will gently go through the gears, warning them, calling them, escalating carefully, calmly, but there needs to be appropriate escalation so that the child learns that he is not in control, that the father is in control, and wants what's best for the child. So God gently but carefully escalates. And so, yeah, we end with the death of the firstborn, but we don't start there. We start with a staff being turned into a snake. God does not want to bring judgment. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love. And every time Pharaoh cries out, even when Pharaoh's motives are very, very mixed at best, the Lord kindly intervenes. Flick forward to chapter 9, verse 25 to 30, which we have read to us. Chapter 9, verses 25 to 30. See the mercy of God on page 66. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people. 
people and animals, it beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was the land of Goshen where the Israelites were. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron, this time I have sinned. This time? This time? Seriously? You've been sinning all the way through. I mean, there's no genuine repentance here. It's not like I've been, a, I've been outrageous, I've been enslaving people all the way through. This time I've sinned as though I'm prepared to admit it now. It's just pride. But even so, look at God's mercy. The Lord is in the right, and I and the people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hell. I will let you go. You don't have to stay longer. Moses replied, When I've gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop, and there will be no more hell. So you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord. Moses is saying, Look, I've seen the pattern. Every time you want some mercy, you cry out, but it's not authentic. You just want the Lord to stop. But you can't muck around with God. But even so, even though he knows Pharaoh is being double-minded, he still shows mercy. God still shows mercy. And so he stops the hailstorm, and as soon as that happens, Pharaoh hardens his heart, and we're back to square one. Do you see the mercy of God? Why does he constantly stop his acts of judgment when he knows that Pharaoh is being double-minded? Because Pharaoh asks for help, and God gives him help straight away. And it would all be ended like that if Pharaoh would just cry out and let them go. The Lord is not mocked. Friends, I don't know what you think of God this morning. He is slow to anger. He hates judgment. But he won't muck around. The judge of all the earth will do what is right. He will not be mocked. And the moment you cry out to him, he will show you mercy. But if you think you can play around with God, you've sorely misjudged, just as Pharaoh has done. The Lord's mercy versus Pharaoh's sin, and lastly, the Lord's faithfulness versus Pharaoh's duplicity and double-mindedness, and our faithfulness. I wonder if you notice that the Lord predicts all that will happen, and it all happens exactly as he predicts. Last, a flick back. Flick back with me to chapter 3, now, and verse 16 on page 16. I want you to see that God says everything is going to happen, and it happens exactly according to what God has said. Verse 16 of chapter 3. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt, into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. Do you see how the Lord knows every detail before it happens? Nothing surprises God. He knows what's going to happen. He says what's going to happen. And he restates this prediction again in chapter 6, verses 2 to 8. We don't have time to look at it. And he keeps telling Moses and Aaron that he will do something before he does it. Why? So that we can see that he is a God who is faithful, trustworthy. Every word of his is true and every word of his comes true. Such is God's power and faithfulness. And that is one of the meanings of L-O-R-D, capital L-O-R-D. It is the Lord, the one who makes and keeps his promises. He's not like us, where so often we say something and then we go back on our word. And he's not two-faced like Pharaoh. We don't have the time to look at it, but four times Pharaoh calls on Moses and says he will let the people go. For your notes, chapter 8, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 28, chapter 9, verse 27, and chapter 10, verse 16. And each time he goes back on his word. And even at the end, after the death of the firstborn, when he finally says, I'm broken, you can take the people out. You know what he does? He gathers his army and he pursues the Israelites and tries to kill them in the instant of the Red Sea. Pharaoh is totally double-minded. He says one thing, he does another. And even Moses and Aaron are pretty faithless. They see God's power, but they don't believe it. They have every reason to trust God, but they don't. The point is that God is the only faithful one. Friends, I don't know how you rate yourself, but I look at my own life. Very rarely is my yes fully a yes, or my no a no. 
there is a faithlessness to the human condition. We long to be true to our word. We know that society only works when we tell the truth. And yet we tell half-truths or white lies, as we call them, distortions. We don't trust God as we should do. One of the highest values of this generation is authenticity. It's a generation that want our leaders to do what they say and say in accordance with their actions. Ed Miliband, the former Labour leader in the election in 2015, put his six core commitments, I wonder if you remember this, on the Ed Stone. It was like a 10-foot stone pillar. His idea was that in an age where we don't trust politicians to kind of a grand gesture to show that he could be you know, taken seriously and trusted. Of course, it meant uh, numerous internet memes of him standing there with an old beard like Moses and people mocking the Ed Stone. I'm, I'm told the Ed Stone is now being used as a table somewhere. But it didn't really do the job because people thought a politician, can we really trust you? If you're a politician here this morning, you're very welcome. Perhaps you're different. <laughs> Come and grab Do you see the contrast? God can be trusted. God is faithful. And such is his commitment to faithfulness that he will take it all the way. He will not let his people go. He will force, compel Pharaoh to let his people go. He is committed to his people. And if you want to know how committed God is to his people, he will go beyond the scope of the Exodus to sending his son to a cross, dying the death that we deserve to die for our lack of faith, for our double mindedness, for our sin like Pharaoh, so that we can be set free. God's commitment to rescuing his people as he said he is, is unwavering. He'll even take them to the jaws of death. Because he says he will save his people and he will do that. He does it at the Exodus and he does it through Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing about the cross is at the cross God gives us the opportunity to not receive the judgment we deserve. But to receive the mercy we want. He takes on death so that we can experience life. He takes on the full, Jesus Christ takes on the full plagues of God's judgment. Separation from God disillusionment, destruction, and ultimately death, so that we can have presence with God, friendship with God, a life with God, joy and happiness and health, and we can be set free. So can I finish by asking the question, what do you think God is like? Perhaps you're saying, well, I'm not even sure there is a God. Well, this is what God is like, revealed in space, time, and history. Can I warn you to be careful of the phrase, I like to think that God is, dot, dot, dot. Chances are when you say that, you're just constructing a God from your own imagination. The real God, the living God, is far more compelling. He is powerful beyond what we can imagine. He is merciful, way beyond what we deserve. And he is faithful in a way that means we can take him at his word and trust him. Do you know him? Do you want to know him? <clears throat> Come to him, he says this morning. Come and know me as the Lord. Let me lead us in a prayer. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to God as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Heavenly Father, how we praise you that as we see you in Scripture and here in the instance of the Exodus, we see you as you really are a God of amazing power and might in comparison to our weakness, a God of amazing and incredible mercy, even though we are sinful and faithless, and a God of great faithfulness that you make and keep your promises, even when we wander away from you and don't trust you. Help us this morning, wherever we're coming from, to know you better, to know you as you reveal yourself to be, and help us to worship you and to love you for who you are, and we ask it for Jesus' sake.